This is our first panel, our panel on uh, current Great Lakes issues, uh, state and federal perspectives. And the way this is going to work, I'm going to introduce the panel members individually. Um, I'll let them uh, talk for about five minutes about some of the issues that they're dealing with, uh, and then I'll introduce the next panelist. Uh, also, there, are, there should be more note cards for your questions, and, and you can send those to the folks walking around the room as you generate questions, uh, and they'll be brought up uh, to the panel. Uh, I'm first going to start with uh, Danielle Chesky. She joined the Embassy of Canada as the Environmental Affairs Office uh, in 2015, covering transboundary water and wildlife issues. Since moving to Washington, D.C. in 2010, she served as Director of the Great Lakes Washington Program at the Northeast Midwest Institute providing research and policy advisory support to the Great Lakes region and congressional delegation. She worked on uh, interstate fisheries policies and legislation along the Atlantic coast, and she served as Sea Grant Fellow in the office of Senator Mariah Cantwell of Washington. Danielle holds a Master of Science in Marine Biology and a Master of Science in Marine Policy from the University of Maine. Uh, growing, up, growing up in the Great Lakes region, she brings a fondness for the outdoors along with her science and policy background in environmental and water issues. Uh, this is very interesting. Outside of work, Danielle serves as a soccer official at the professional, amateur, and collegiate level. Please help me welcome Danielle. Thanks so much for having me. We're, uh, the government of Canada is very happy to be here and to discuss the Great Lakes. As you heard from a lot of the speakers this morning, uh, there is an international border there. And you all might laugh, but a lot of people don't realize that, uh, including apparently the director of the Office of Management and Budget. So uh, very happy that the congressman was able to clarify that geographical situation with him. Um, uh, Canada and the U.S. have worked together on many, many issues over the years. Our boundary is 43% water, so it's a very large issue for our co two countries, uh, dating back to an international treaty that was signed in 1909 called the Boundary Waters Treaty. Out of that came the International Joint Commission, which is uh, really an arm's length entity that helps to manage the waters and to really depoliticize the issues that they are um, or that they can be with it. Uh, the Great Lakes uh, is shared between the eight Great Lakes states and the two Canadian provinces of Ontario and Quebec. Uh, and the, I guess the foundation of that is the 1972 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that was signed under the senior Trudeau. His son is now the Prime Minister. And President Nixon. And that was renewed back in 2012 under President Obama and Prime Minister Harper. And so I think the thing, if you know anything about either U.S. or Canadian politics, you're seeing that party really doesn't matter, whether on the U.S. side or the Canadian side. Uh, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, uh, as updated, is a strong commitment from both countries to protect, preserve, and restore the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative that you all know and have heard quite a bit about is sort of the U.S. commitment uh, in terms of funding and providing for the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And so on our side, because it's a slightly different government system, it's a parliamentary system with the provinces, uh, it's a little bit more divided up between in terms of responsibilities between them. Um, but we have a few different funding sources that we put forth, including a new commitment on infrastructure from the federal government, as well as commitments for freshwater resources and cleanup of our areas of concern. A um, couple of things I just wanted to highlight today in terms of some of those uh, cross-border work actually has to do with aquatic invasive species. Um, so you might have heard of something called the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee. It was originally created back in 2010 when they found uh, silver and bighead carp up near Chicago. Um, and so Canada and Ontario serve on that as well. So it's actually a bi-national entity at this point. Uh, Canada has really promoted the fact that there are four species of Asian carp that need to be addressed. And the committee and the states and the provinces are all looking at all four of them. Uh, you heard the state senator mention that there was a uh, Asian carp found up in one of the provinces. We've actually found multiple uh, Asian carp up there. And they're specifically the species of grass carp. 
And so when we talk about the different species, there's a lot of focus on Illinois and sort of the ones that fly up and hit people and, you know, people come out with the big nets and the and whatever else that they do to try to capture them and hit them down and stuff. And it's amusing. Um, but we're talking about a slightly different species there that needs to be kept out of the Great Lakes. And Canada has been on board with that all along. We have a species that's already in the Great Lakes. It's in Lake Erie. It's called grass carp. And that's what we've been finding up in the St. Lawrence River um, and uh, throughout Lake Erie. Um, and so those are legal. Some of those are legally there. Uh, they are not allowed there. They can't reproduce. Um, but some have been found that can reproduce. And that's a big concern. So Canada worked with U.S. partners uh, here to do a risk assessment on grass carp. And that was just released earlier this year. And so we're sort of at that stage when you think about invasive species where we've identified that they're here. And so now is the time to act to make sure that they don't establish. We have a real good opportunity right now, I think, uh, to to work to make sure that there is an establishment, that there isn't long-term impacts of this. Um, I think one of the other major binational sort of success stories on invasive species has been sea lamprey control. And you'll notice that I'll say control and not eradication, because that's going to be a control for the next years and years and years. And the money that goes into that, it's about 20 million per year from the U.S. side, and it's about 14 million from the Canadian side, just because of the different responsibilities for monitoring with it. And that's going to be an ongoing investment on and on. And so I think where we're at and we've where we've been looking and working with our American counterparts is to keep that, keep the grass carp from becoming an eradication, from an eradication program into a control program on it. So uh, just wanted to highlight that there is a lot of ongoing efforts on that, on water, on invasive species, transportation, infrastructure. Um, the Great Lakes region itself is the world's third largest economy. And so there are a lot of jobs that specifically depend on that. In Michigan itself, it's almost 300,000 jobs that depend upon uh, interactions and trades with Canada. So we uh, happily work across the board with our, Cana our American counterparts and uh, continue to look forward to it. So thanks. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Jordan Dickinson. Uh, he was born and raised in Grand Blake, Michigan, and is Congressman Dan Kildee's senior legislative assistant. Uh, Jordan received a degree in public policy from Michigan State University in 2012 and a master's degree in energy policy and climate from Johns Hopkins University in 2016. Following undergraduate graduation, Jordan worked for the former Congressman Dale Kildee and when he retired in 2013, joined the staff of Congressman Dan Kildee. As part of Jordan's responsibilities, he focuses on protecting the Great Lakes from nuclear waste from Canada, from invasive species, and net pen aquaculture. In addition to this work, Jordan led Congressman Kildee's efforts to bring aid to the people of Flint during the water crisis. Let's welcome Jordan. Thank you, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I want to talk, I've been working for Congressman Kildee, um, both Kildees, for about five, five and a half years. And I work on Great Lakes issues as a part of my portfolio, but I work on a wide range of things where I advise my boss on from education and energy policy to uh, trade and foreign affairs. Um, and so, but throughout that work, there's been no single issue which has been more bipartisan, more nonpartisan even. Um, than Great Lakes things. Uh, Ava and I have worked on a ton of things together with Mr. Molinar when he was on the Budget Committee and still now, and we work across political spectrum on Great Lakes issues. Um, and that's what makes the Great Lakes so interesting and unique and fun to work on and also so important. Um, I also got to say Danielle, she was one of the first people when I started working here, she was a mentor and helped me and taught me a lot about the, what I know about the Great Lakes now um, and that we work sometimes together, sometimes against each other on a few different things. Um, but Danielle talked a lot about grass carp and uh, Mr. Molinar talked a lot about funding. And I think one thing that I would wanna impress on people is that invasive species, we have focused a lot on what's going on with Asian carp and there's been less of focus on uh, grass carp. Um, but what we've really been fighting here in DC is that 
the GLRI Great Lakes Restoration Initiative um, came out under Obama, and uh, the, that administration was really familiar with it. They created the program. But this new administration really isn't so familiar with it, as we've talked about with the budget director and his comments about um, the GLRI. So what's really important for us is that we need to tell them that, number one, this is, this is what this program does, this is why it works, and this is why we need it. And number two is that the threat of grass carp, Asian carp in general, and invasive species even beyond, is a huge threat to our livelihood as who we are as Michiganders. Um, there's a lot of talk about, well, the commerce interests in Illinois or Indiana are really important, so we can't do these things to protect the uh, invasive species from coming to the Great Lakes. But I think, uh, from what my boss would think also, is that kind of undervalues our way of life here in Michigan. The way of life of people of Illinois doesn't matter more than what it does here. Uh, I mean, if nothing else, we're at least equal. So we really need to impress on people that even though these other people have their interests that they're concerned about, we still have a lot of jobs, livelihood, water, drinking water that comes from the Great Lakes that we have to care about just as much. It's really much a part of our fabric here as Michiganders. So as, we, as you go out and you talk to people and you become engaged and you want to tell people about what the Great Lakes is and how special it is. So I think that's broadly where we are as far as funding and why I think Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which is the main funding source for um, Great Lakes, is uh, where it is. But a couple other issues that we have worked on um, that maybe that haven't really been touched on much here uh, is aquaculture or net pen aquaculture. So there have been, uh, and this is one of these areas where Danielle and I maybe don't work together on, but uh, we work together sometimes on this. So um, there have been some efforts uh, to start raising. So there's a huge issue. People want to eat a lot of fish, but we don't have enough in the oceans that we can sustainably grow to sustain the need. Uh, people want to eat fish. So there have been a lot of efforts to start using um, aquaculture, in the, mostly in the ocean, to grow fish. Salmon is probably the most common one. Um, what they also want to do is maybe do that in the Great Lakes. Um, there's a lot of issues regarding the pollution. Um, a, a, a net pen, uh, I wish I had a picture, can produce as much pollution as a, a town of about 60,000 people. Also, having that many animals in one confined area in a net pen um, can spread disease. And so those things are th issues that we don't want to add into the Great Lakes. We're dealing with a lot of pollution issues and disease issues as we are, already are. So my boss um, has been working to make sure we don't do that in the Great Lakes. And we do this in areas where more confined place or a closed net pen, something onshore where it doesn't spread into the ecosystem of everyone else. So um, happy to take questions about that later. But that's something uh, that's on the horizon that people are talking to as we look at how we're going to get food in the future. Um, another issue that we've been working on for a while with the Canadians is they would like to build a, step back just a little bit, the largest nuclear operating nuclear power plant in the entire world is uh, at Bruce Nuclear Power Plant in Kincardine, Ontario, which is about, I don't know, an hour and a half north of uh, Sarnia. So they have a whole bunch of nuclear waste there. In Canada, actually in Ontario, they don't have any coal power at all. Everything's either through nuclear power or hydro, pretty much. Um, and so they have a ton of nuclear waste. We have our own issues with nuclear waste storage in the United States. We want to ship it out to Nevada, and there's been a lot of political wins against that. But Canada, they'd like to build uh, a nuclear waste repository um, half mile from the Great Lakes. So we've been working in a very bipartisan manner, I, I mean, is, uh, to work with the Canadians to say, maybe we should find a place that's not so close, close to the Great Lakes. Um, Canada is very huge, uh, I think maybe the second biggest country in the world. Uh, so we think there's probably a better place to store the nuclear waste than a half mile to close to the Great Lakes. Um, so those are two big things. And a final thing, just because I know it's not Great Lakes related, but thing that people are very interested in. Um, I was driving here today from Flint, and it was about two years ago that I got a call from Danielle, um, who was working at the Northeast Midwest Institute that deals with a lot of issues with similar economies in the Northeast and Midwest. Um, she called me and said, hey, Jordan, we have a scientist here. Her name's Elin. And uh, she said that there's serious lead issues in Flint, and we need to talk to you about it, I need to do something. So it was kind of, it was last time I was up here um, when I got that call from Danielle, it was actually kind of funny, it was at 
absolutely deluged driving down the highway. I had to pull over because I had to, couldn't concentrate on both at the same time. So um, Flint water crisis is still something that we work on every day. Drinking water quality is something that should be very important to people um, that we kind of take for granted. And um, my work on that has shown that, that we uh, kind of took that for granted for too long. Um, so happy to take questions about that. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jordan. Next, I'd like to introduce Ann Garwood. Ann is the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Ecologist for the Water Resources Division in the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Ann is the lead staff on Michigan's wetland monitoring efforts, including planning and implementation of monitoring projects, and as a co-principal investigator on the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program of US EPA. Anne provides technical expertise and assistance on protection, management, and restoration of Great Lakes coastal wetlands to regulatory staff, other state agencies, and the general public. Anne also works on climate change adaptation for Michigan's wetlands and waters, and on aquatic invasive species management efforts through participation on the Michigan Invasive Species Corps teams. Help me welcome Anne Garwood. Thanks so much, Don. I'm really glad to be here. Um, and talk right into it. More? <laughs> yeah. OK, can you guys hear me now? All right. Um, as Don mentioned, I work in the Water Resources Division of the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. I'm in uh, what we call the Wetlands, Lakes, and Streams Unit. Um, our unit is sort of a group of technical experts that provides um, expertise on a whole variety of areas related to wetlands, lakes, and streams management in Michigan. Um, one area that our unit is heavily involved in that people are familiar with is the regulatory program, so the laws that protect Michigan's wetlands, lakes, and streams. Um, and we do provide technical expertise on, you know, permitting and regulatory decisions in this program. Um, another area that we implement is the wetland monitoring program, as Don mentioned. Um, I'm the coordinator of that program. Um, and so I do want to talk a little bit about what that what that means in Michigan. I'm also a representative on the invasive species core teams, as he mentioned. Um, so Michigan finalized our wetland monitoring and assessment strategy update in 2015. Um, there was a previous version of that strategy that that um, in a nutshell said that we should develop a program. Um, so we now have a program um, and it it is outlined through eight objectives and it follows EPA's recommendations for uh, state wetland monitoring program. Um, basically, the eight objectives of our wetland monitoring assessment program are to inventory Michigan's wetland resources, to update the national wetland inventory in Michigan um, in order to enable status and trends monitoring of wetlands in Michigan, um, applying landscape level assessment on a watershed scale, which is sort of looking within the watershed at different wetlands, where they're located, um, and what functions and values individual wetlands are provided. Um, and which functions and values have been lost in certain areas due to wetland loss. Um, we're talking about, you know, some wetlands may provide more groundwater recharge, while other wetlands may provide more flood storage, um, more habitat values, things like that. Um, we also use the Michigan Rapid Assessment Method to quickly and efficiently um, evaluate the functions and values provided by different types of wetlands, regardless of ecological type, um, statewide. Um, so that is is a is a technique that we developed here in Michigan um, over about 10 years, but we've been implementing since 2008. Um, another goal of the strategy is to use biotic indicators as well as physiochemical indicators um, to monitor the condition of wetlands on the ground. Um, so we do partner with Central Michigan University and Don's program uh, in particular to implement statewide wetland monitoring that looks at vegetation, uh, macroinvertebrates, water chemistry, and then landscape characteristics, which would um, impact the quality and condition of Michigan's wetlands. Um, and then to provide for the Michigan's mo most outstanding water wetland resources to be monitored, um, particularly Great Lakes coastal wetlands. Um, so we also partner on Don's Great Lakes coastal wetland monitoring project that's monitoring wetlands throughout the entire Great Lakes basin. 
Uh, we are a partner on that project. Our role in that project is not actually the data collection or data analysis. It is to encourage the use of that information by land managers and wetland managers and state and federal agencies to actually make improvements in how we manage these resources. Um, so what we're really trying to do is be that bridge between the academic community and the, the practitioners on the landscape so that this data doesn't just sort of build up and accumulate without leading to improved management of these natural resources on the ground. Um, so we facilitate that through meetings and webinars, and we also facilitate that through um, outreach to individual groups like you know the de departments of natural resources throughout the basin, tribal communities, and local communities. Um, and we, we facilitate that also through management of accounts on the website um, where you can access the data. We review account requests um, at different levels and can help determine if those levels are appropriate. Um, and then finally, our last objective in the monitoring strategy is to implement statewide wetland monitoring on a five-year cycle that aligns with the National Wetland Condition Assessment. Uh, you may be familiar with this, these National Aquatic Resource Surveys that are conducted on a five-year cycle by EPA. Um, they use consistent protocols to monitor lakes, streams, and wetlands, um, and then the Great Lakes every five years. Um, so Michigan does participate in that, and we did participate in the 2016, um, and that is when we launched our state-scale wetland monitoring program as well. Um, we, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm also a member of the Aquatic Invasive Species Core Team in Michigan. Um, in 2010, Michigan formed a joint team uh, made up of multiple agencies of state departments called the Aquatic Invasive Species Core Team. Um, which were program specialist staff, um, and the team has grown over several years to over 20 representatives now from Michigan DEQ, Office of the Great Lakes, Department of Natural Resources, Seth is on that team as well, um, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, and the Department of Transportation. Um, initially, that team was formed to update the state management plan for aquatic invasive species, which we did in 2013, the update was finalized. Um, the broad four goals of that plan are to prevent new introductions of AIS into Michigan waters, to limit the dispersal and spread of populations of AIS within the state, um, to develop an early detection and rapid response program for new detections of aquatic invasive species, and to manage and control um, problematic aquatic invasive species that are here to lessen the harmful ecological and economic and social impacts of those species. Um, Notable in the plan update is that it is now organized on a pathway approach. There was recognition that um, management of invasive species could be more successful if you focus on the ways and the means by which these species are transported rather than always just targeting an individual species. Um, so the plan is organized in a way that, that addresses pathways, including the shipping and boating pathway, organisms and trade pathway, and habitat alteration. Um, some examples of this that you're probably familiar with are in the shipping and boating. There's maritime um, ballast water issues. There's also recreational boating issues. Um, organisms in trade includes fish bait or um, aquatic plants that are sold in aquarium trade, things like that. Habitat alteration is getting at you know, construction work that's happening on our waters. Um, oftentimes these are actually restoration projects, but sometimes it includes construction or maintenance of canals and lift docks, transportation facilities. Um, some of the most notable accomplishments of the AIS program in Michigan have included um, the establishment of the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program. The state does give out grants now for management and research looking at aquatic invasive species. Um, it has done that for several years. We also have implemented a policy, um, an internal policy for the quality of life departments, which include DEQ, DNR, and MDARD, the Agricultural and Rural Development, which requires our staff to decontaminate for invasive species. Um, and then we've also established a quality of life policy and procedure response plan for introductions of new invasive species. Um, so that's basically all I wanted to talk to you guys about right now, but I'm happy to take questions on any of those items. All right, thank you. Let's thank Ann. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Seth Herbst at 
um, he has been an aquatic invasive species coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Division since the inception of the position in 2014. Uh, as the AIS coordinator, he collaborates with multiple state and federal agencies as well as numerous universities to address high priority invasive species issues such as invasive carp prevention and early detection and response actions. Seth has also gained professional experience through his previous work as a fisheries techni technician with the Wisconsin and Minnesota DNR Fisheries Division. After earning his undergraduate degree in fisheries and water resource from Un University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, he's also earned a Master of Science from University of Vermont, and that was in natural resources, aquatic ecology, and watershed science, and a PhD from Michigan State University's Fisheries and Wildlife. His professional interests are in management and ecology of freshwater fishes, with an emphasis on invasive species, community ecology, and population dynamics. Please help me welcome Seth. Thank you, Don, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk today with the, the group here. Um, so aquatic invasive species are obviously a high priority for the Great Lakes Basin. Um, that's evident through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, having aquatic invasive species be one of the focal areas within that uh, funding opportunity. And if you look at aquatic invasive species, it's one of the, the major issues that threatens not only the Great Lakes, but all aquatic, in, or all aquatic systems throughout the world. Um, and if you look at Michigan's natural resources, we had Senator Burr, uh, Boer this morning talk about the 11,000 lakes, inland lakes that we have within Michigan. We also have uh, roughly 3,000 miles of Great Lakes shoreline, hundreds of thousands of inland rivers and streams. So the state of Michigan has a very uh, rich history of dealing with aquatic systems. And those aquatic systems within the state of Michigan are so linked to the economy. If you look at uh, some of the economic perspectives related to the, our water natural resources, you have a $7 billion fish, sport fishery in the Great Lakes on an annual basis. That's quite a bit of uh, resource um, use coming through the Great Lakes just for sport fishing. If you look at recreational boating in Michigan alone, it's $16 million on an annual basis. So you can start to build um, the case of how important it is to protect those aquatic systems throughout the state and how important um, addressing aquatic invasive species are for the state of Michigan and the Great Lakes Basin as a whole. Um, so as a aquatic invasive species coordinator for the fisheries division here in Michigan, um, my work really revolves around implementing the aquatic invasive species management plan that Ann had just mentioned, our invasive carp management plan, and, and also, um, you know, if you look at the, the dedication to those efforts. So Aquatic Invasive Species Management Plan, Invasive Carp Management Plan. Up until 2014, the funding for implementing both of those plans were heavily federal funded. And that's through Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and continues to be heavily funded through Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We did have a high point in 2014 when the, get, when the governor allocated Five million dollars of the state budget to aquatic invasive species. Three point six million um, directly goes out in the form of grants for the state. Um, that's a dedicated resource there that we haven't had in the past. That is certainly a, a step in the right direction to help address some of these big invasive species threats throughout the state. Um, one of the things that I want to uh, touch on right now is the invasive carp challenge. So not only do we now have state funding for invasive species, but within uh, the seven, FY17 um, governor's budget, we had $1 million allocated to implement an invasive carp challenge. I'm sure some of you guys have, have heard about this challenge. It's a, a unique and, and in a innovative idea at trying to um, 
come up with a solution to preventing the spread of, of big head and silver carp. Um, as of right now, we're working with a, a private crowdsourcing company um, called Inicentive that uh, is helping us implement this, this uh, challenge. Um, and if you guys aren't familiar, there is a website that you can collect more information and potentially help us out with providing a solution. Um, so I did want to highlight that. And it really just goes to show the, the dedicated resources that we are starting to see now from the state of Michigan versus what used to be um, historically completely federally funded. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I'm, I'm really um, looking into implementing those plans all the way from prevention, which is really critical when it comes to invasive species. Prevention of an aquatic invasive species is always the most uh, effective use of resources. Um, and then, you know, the next steps of early detection, eradication, and control. And sitting here at, at uh, Central Michigan University, um, I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about some of the science that some of the faculty members here at CMU have done and partnered with this on, with us on. So I know that uh, Dr. Andy Mahon is is in the next panel, but he's really advanced the science with some of the early detection through the use of environmental DNA, um, and then. Also, uh, grass carp have been an issue that uh, we've been dealing with um, and actively addressing since 2014. And the state of Michigan uh, was able to, to get federal GLRI dollars to work with Dr. Mahon and, and Dr. Kevin Pangle um, to address some of the grass carp issues that we had in Lake Erie. So I know that... Uh, Sometimes grass carp seem to be lower on the radar than maybe big head and silver carp. Um, that's by design. Uh, they, have, they have different invasion histories and different risks to uh, the Great Lakes resources. Um, and just to, to speak to that a little bit, grass carp, uh, historically, first detection of grass carp was in the mid-1980s in Lake Erie. Um, we have not seen population explosions of grass carp since the 1980s. Uh, in comparison, um, big head and silver carp first detection was, was really in the early 90s, and now we're seeing hundreds of thousands of, of fish um, linked to some of the YouTube clips that I'm sure many have seen uh, showing up not only in the Mississippi River, Illinois River, but a lot of the other major waterways that make up the the Midwest um, portion of the of the country. Um, so we are addressing grass carp in Lake Erie, um, but uh, our largest priority, biggest priority, is preventing big head and silver carp from the Great Lakes. Um, so as part of uh, those efforts, um, the invasive carp challenge is, is one step in the right direction since 2010. We've also been a part of the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee, which, which Danielle had uh, mentioned, the DFO and, and uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry are also a part of. Um, and really, that's a, a group, a coordinated regional group that, ad that addresses how to reduce the risk of spread of big head and silver carp into the Great Lakes. Um, and basically, the the entities that sit at that table are federal and state agencies around the Great Lakes. Um, another another thing that I want to point out is uh, some of the other emerging issues that we've had recently in the in the state of Michigan. Um, so, New Zealand mud snails. Uh, it's an invasive snail that has now infested four of our major. Uh, trout stream, so Pier Marquette, Boardman River, the Osabal River, and now the Upper Manistee. Um, unfortunately, like, like many invasive species, this is one that we don't have a, a control for, so really we're at the standpoint of trying to contain that species where they currently are, um, and we have a lot of ongoing work related to New Zealand mud snails and working with uh, increasing awareness and education and outreach related to that species. Um, another in new infestation that occurred this summer was red swamp crayfish. Uh, it's, a in, it's an invasive crayfish that uh, is considered to be one of the 
most widespread worldwide um, invaders. Uh, they likely showed up through one of the multiple pathways that Ann had, uh, had mentioned, um, likely in organisms and trades. So we do have two locations, major epicenters of infestations in the state of Michigan that um, were detected within three days of each other. So that made my, uh, <laughs> my schedule pretty booked. Um, but anyhow, Sunset Lake uh, in Vicksburg, Michigan is one infestation area. And then down in Novi, um, there's another infestation of red swamp crayfish. So since July, um, when those when that species was uh, first detected, we've been actively trapping on and monitoring um, for that species to try to reduce any potential negative impacts that uh, red swamp crayfish might have. Um, I had mentioned it, the invasive carp. Um, we as as I had said, grass carp uh, is another part of uh, my day-to-day -day duties. Um, typically, that is what I would consider a very regional issue. Um, as with any invasive species, uh, really state borders or provincial borders don't limit the spread. So right now we're, we're currently working, you know, I had mentioned uh, Dr. Mahon and Dr. Pangle's work, but we're also working with Michigan State and other jurisdictions around uh, Lake Erie to really come to a strategic coordinated approach at uh, implementing a science-based control program or response program, I should say, um, in Lake Erie. Um, and since 2014, we've been partnering with our commercial fisher fishers in Lake Erie to remove grass carp. Um, it's by no means at the same level of infestation in, uh, as compared with big head and silver carp in the Illinois River. Um, to put things in perspective, uh, over the last five years, we've removed about 100 um, grass carp from Lake Erie. Over the last five years, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources has removed 5 million pounds of big head and silver carp from the Illinois River. Um, so drastically different uh, infestation levels there. But right now we're at the point where we're trying to um, respond to threats of grass carp in Lake Erie to make sure that we don't get to those same levels that Illinois is seeing with big head and silver carp. Um, I had touched on a, a few of our regional approaches, but it uh, really can't be described enough that aquatic invasive species throughout the Great Lakes Basin is very collaborative. Um, we've worked with multiple state and federal agencies along as, uh, as well as universities to address some of our, our key priorities with invasive species, and we will continue to do so. Um, and we're actively continuing to uh, compete for Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding to address some of those priorities. And then at the state level, um, one of the things that we're really trying to do is build our partnerships with local groups, such as our cooperative invasive species management areas. A lot of those groups have local expertise and knowledge and can greatly um, assist with controlling invasive species, but also fantastic at citizen science and, and early detection. So that's something that we're really trying to build capacity, primarily through our invasive species program. Um, and then lastly, one of the things that I also wanted to mention uh, of note is the implementation of mutual aid agreement for aquatic invasive species response in, in the Great Lakes. This was an agreement that was put together by the Conference of Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers. Um, it's been implemented four times now since it was uh, created in 2015. Um, and the state of Michigan has either led or participated in each one of those response actions. Um, two of which, three of which have been linked with grass carp in, in Lake Erie. So I'm looking forward to any questions and conversation that we might have today linked with aquatic invasive species. Thank you. Next, I want to introduce Eva Verana. She received her BS in Applied Ecology from the School of Forest Resources and Environmental Sciences at Michigan Tech in 2014. 
She's worked as a research assistant on the Isle Royal Wolf Moose Study. She was Demer Scholar through Michigan State University, working in the Secretary's Office of the U.S. Department of Interior in the Office of Policy Analysis. She first served as a staff member in U.S. Representative Dan Benichek's office, Michigan's first district. Ms. Verana presently is a legislative assistant for U.S. Representative John Moulinar for Michigan's fourth district. She's been a staff member for Representative Moulinar since his election in 2015. Her legislative portfolio includes education, natural resources, environment, energy, science, space, and technology. Please help me welcome Eva. So I want to thank everyone on this panel for covering a lot of the natural resources issues that are, you know, very current. Um, and Jordan and I actually overlap on a lot of legislative issues, so our portfolios are quite similar, and we often bump into each other via email. Um, so I guess I want to start with just talking about my background briefly. Um, so, I, you know, I, I make this joke at every talk. Um, I like to say that I almost literally crawled out of the woods from Michigan Tech and just ended up in D.C. Um, so I was studying what was essentially forestry at Michigan Tech. So we have a forest resources program, and I specialize in ecology. Um, my you know, up until about my senior year of college, which wasn't very long ago, um, I really was angling myself to go into forestry and become a forester. So the shift into policy was pretty massive. And when I told my parents after um, my fellowship program in DC that I wasn't coming home, uh, they were a little concerned because I didn't have a job or a place to live. Um, so, my time in D.C. led me to Capitol Hill, and I started working with Congressman Beneshek. Um, and when, the, when Congressman Molinar was elected, I moved into his office. So, again, most, most of the legislative current natural resources issues were brought up by Jordan. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my position specifically and how that plays into the federal funding. So Congressman Molinar uh, was recently appointed to the Appropriations Committee. And this, this position allows him ha to have a more direct say in funding. Um, and this obviously is a crucial connection for the state of Michigan, uh, having the spokesman like uh, Congressman Molinar being right there to point out different funding sources that, like the GLRI, that are, are very important uh, to the state of Michigan. Uh, so as a staff member uh, with the congressman, one of my big roles is learning and understanding the intricacies of the appropriations pro process in general. Um, and, you know, that makes myself and the congressman a better advocate for things like the GLRI. Um, in my background, it, you know, it's, it's been a great help for me. Um, you know, when I first went to D.C., I did notice there was a disconnect between the policymakers and people on the ground, you know, the, the researchers, the scientists that are doing these projects. And, you know, if, w once I ended up in DC, I knew that's where I needed to be because working for a congressman from Michigan, my heart is in Michigan, my background's in natural resources. And so this is just a natural place for me to find myself. And y now that uh, Congressman Molinar does sit on appropriations and you know, can advocate for funding sources like the GLRI, which everyone here has gone into a lot of detail on. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and that's mostly what I have to say. <laughs> okay, let's think. All right, we're going to start with our first question. Uh, what do you, and this is, this is open for everyone here, um, what do you feel are the biggest differences in how U.S. and Canada approach Great Lakes issues? Uh, well, actually, I would say that there's actually a lot of similarities with it. Um, so I think just maybe the differences in terms of the population that is around there. So uh, oftentimes people will cite the fact that the Great Lakes provides drinking water to 40 million, 
So about 30 million of those individuals are in the U.S. and 10 million are in Canada. Um, but I think the, the only the real difference is that we have different uh, government systems and in terms of how those um, uh, responsibilities are divided up. There's some very strong differences between what's within the federal and the provincial sector versus what's federal versus state here in the U.S. Um, but I think the Great Lakes is the good example of where uh, there's good cross-boundary and uh, cross-federal level discussions to ensure that a lot of those issues don't fall through the cracks on it um, and that there's good addressing of it. And so there's a lot of good discussions between myself and like you saw Jordan, between the government of Canada and the state of Michigan, with the province of Ontario, with the province of Quebec, even if it's in French sometimes. So no, there's, I, think, I think there's a lot of good discussions going back and forth and uh, approaches to it. The mutual aid agreement was referenced, which is, uh, um, has to do with invasive species, and that's at the state and provincial level. Um, and there's support from that uh, for those efforts through federal laws as well. So I think there's a lot of good discussions there and a lot of good approaches to make sure that um, the issues are addressed and are addressed holistically. So. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, what is the current status of H.R. 961, the Ban, uh, ban Aquaculture in the Great Lakes Act? Uh, does it have support from the Great Lakes state reps? So uh, H.R. 961 is a bill that my, be be uh, my boss introduced that would obviously ban aquaculture in the Great Lakes. Um, there is kind of a mixed bag, uh, at least at the state level. Uh, there are some members on both sides, uh, most even uh, mostly the Republicans have been really interested in. Some members have uh, introduced a bill that would do pretty much the same or even go further in saying they would ban aquaculture in the Great Lakes or any of its tributaries. Um, there is a kind of a hot button issue uh, up on the Osabel River where a gentleman would like to take an old state fish hatchery and turn it into an aquaculture operation. Um, I'm not a fly fisherman, but I've learned that the Osaba River is some of the greatest fly fishing in the entire country. Um, a conservation organization, Trout Unlimited, uh, was actually started there to make sure they could preserve uh, that river. So we have also introduced a bill that would ban aquaculture on wild and scenic rivers, which is a federal designation given to rivers that have some sort of unique ecological and um, economic value. So. There's been some proposals uh, to do that essentially at the state level. There's been also others that would uh, regulate aquaculture um, in the Great Lakes and in the rivers. And what uh, Attorney General Bill Schutte has come out, they asked him for a, a legal opinion on what, if aquaculture is a law in the Great Lakes, and they said essentially there is no regulation uh, there, so therefore it's not allowed. So not saying that there's an outright ban, but they said that if they want to do it, they have to come so come up with some sort of regulating mechanism to do it. So that's what some members have done. Uh, I haven't really heard too much movement on it. The chair of the Natural Resources Committee in the House ha is a sponsor of the aquaculture ban, um, and there's been some bipartisan support on that. But I don't think there's any updates on that moving. Um, at the federal level, uh, we don't have any co-sponsors yet, uh, but something that we've been talking to members about. Um, there's been a lot of support for uh, probably a move towards uh, providing some incentives to move aquaculture on land as opposed to in the lakes, but uh, an outright ban is not something that's widely supported, I would say, yet. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, Anne mentioned the wetlands monitoring leading to some management issues or decisions. People generally want to see results. Can you elaborate on specific management uh, decisions or results of monitoring that have been ongoing? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> um, not a lot of them yet because the program is so new. Um, so the statewide wetland monitoring program is in year two of five. Um, so at the end of that five years, there will be a report 
that we can put out about the con- the condition and quality of Michigan's wetlands. Um, Michigan has, and the federal government as well, has a no net loss policy of wetland quality and condition. Um, and this is required under the Clean Water Act as well as Michigan's wetland protection law. Um, up until recently, the only way we have been able to sort of um, get at the prevention of loss of Michigan's wetland quality and condition is through the regulatory process. Um, and so that's where you get into if impacts are authorized through a permit, mitigation is required to replace those lost wetland functions. Um, but there are a lot of problems with that. For one thing, not all wetlands are regulated or not all activities are regulated. So there's a big gap in um, wetland impacts that, that don't even go through the permit process. Um, there's also unauthorized activities that have happened. Um, and then there's activities that impact and degrade wetlands that are not in the wetland, right? So nearby landscape alterations and things can significantly degrade wetlands. Habitat fragmentation, um, just development pressure can really degrade wetlands. So. Um, the monitoring program that, that we're implementing statewide is really trying to get at um, our first real attempt to establish, based on science, using these protocols, what is the condition and quality of Michigan's wetlands now? Um, so we have, an, you know, we have a sense of what they are. We know that there's been more loss of wetland and more degradation of wetlands in the southern part of the state than in the northern part of the state, and that's generally not surprising to people. Um, but we want to know what does that really look like? Has there been water quality loss? Has, the, has, there been wa- has there been changes in community composition? What species are living there? Has there been loss of rare species? Has there been loss of groundwater recharge? What does that really mean? Um, and so I would say that we are hopeful that when we have more monitoring results and a real statewide report, we can inform decision making better. Um, in the meantime, what it has meant is that we have had to work on sort of other means to address um, these issues. We work with stakeholder groups to try and develop and improve best management practices for certain for certain things. So we have an agricultural assistance program where we do we work directly with the agriculture community to try and improve their best management practices to reduce their impact on wetlands. Uh, we do the same with um, utility companies. We do the same with local governments. One thing we're promoting um, actively and have been for many years is the establishment of local wetland protection ordinances or natural area ordinances that can protect buffers and things around our, our wetlands and water bodies. Um, we know that having a natural buffer around these water bodies significantly improves and protects the condition and quality of them, and yet state law doesn't have that authority. Um, and so that's something that we know we can't do, and there, there is loss happening because of that. Um, so while the wetland monitoring data today isn't necessarily informing decisions right now, um, we do believe it will in the future, and in the meantime, we're working on all these other means to try and address those issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is for Seth. Uh, you mentioned AIS used citizen science for some of their programs. Can you provide uh, an example of how this is used uh, in the AIS unit? Yeah, so aquatic invasive species, as I had mentioned, prevention is obviously you know the, the ultimate goal with any aquatic invasive species program. Obviously, uh, prevention isn't always feasible, so early detection comes into play. Um, if you can detect a, a species early enough, you have a higher likelihood of eradicating um, that species or at least containing it um, from spreading and both from a geographical standpoint, but then also from an abundance level. Um, so citizen science has really been critical with uh, early detection aspects throughout the Great Lakes. Um, primarily in, in Michigan, we use a lot of our local groups to uh, increase our early detection aspects. Um, as a fisheries division, you know, we have our staff out in the field, but we also have um, roughly one million licensed anglers. Um, and a lot of other recreationalists that are out on the landscape. So they can certainly help with uh, early detection. Um, we do uh, have a, a program or support um, the Midwest in Invasive Species Information Network, which is a reporting site that, that we uh, work with Michigan State University on that uh, is very critical with um, informing us on early detections that we can then respond to. 
Um, and then the, the other thing would be control. And citizen sciences uh, really helped out with uh, control aspects, primarily through our SISMAs or our Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Eva, uh, how has, given your, given your background, how has working with Congressman Mullinar changed or reinforced your perspective of the Great Lakes? So when I, when I actually first came to D.C., um, I was not politically active. I'm assuming that's kind of the angle this question is going. And so I had my background knowledge from Michigan Tech and what I had learned and what I understood. Um, and, I, you know, I... When I went to go work on Capitol Hill, I ended up working for Congressman Beneshek and in found that that was a good fit for me. Um, the background itself uh, with natural resources, uh, you know, obviously when you're talking to your boss or your congressman, it's, it's easier for me to communicate the big issues on the ground, you know, um, and that that is, I credit most of that to my degree program. Um, and translating that to the congressman and then applying it to federal funding, it has been very, it was very helpful. Um, and it's not a job that most people know even exists. And most uh, congressional staffers do have political degrees. Uh, but I found that just working on the Hill, I've learned you know, legislative policy and process just by being there. So having the hard science background uh, makes me a valuable asset for a congressman, especially one from the greatest state in the nation. <laughs> oh, on that, um, we, w I wish we had another hour or two because I, I definitely have that many questions uh, that I did not, was not able to get to. Uh, but we do uh, want to uh, recognize the time commitment here of, of these folks. So please help me thank them for coming to speak to us today.